the security scare at Windsor Castle now, obviously, all sorts of criticisms and speculations are always raised about security costs. But it seems that this would mean that they're valid costs. It does seem kind of sloppy, given that there was no expense being um, paid for Sandringham, which was shut down. And uh, we all knew that any sort of royal action over Christmas is going to be in Windsor, which, of course, is a much easier target. You know, it's right just off an offshoot of London. It does seem extraordinary that somebody clearly I don't know, a curious individual with a rope ladder and an unidentified, not missile, but, you know, weapon of some sort, was able to scale a, a perimeter wall. But, but let's keep this in context. Windsor Estate is large and there are many perimeter walls and he was apprehended pretty promptly. But Richard, I, I believe you've got a theory on the timing of this. Well, all I said, and I've been getting abuse on social media, frankly, oh, for about again. two weeks as a result. <laughs> this is Richard the victim. Yeah. <laughs> Can't pour yeah. it out. But no, all I said was that I do think Harry and Meghan have contributed to this sort of hate speech, frankly, you know, with these accusations of racism and all this unpleasantness has encouraged hate towards the royal family. No. And one but of the main threats to the royal family always comes from um, deranged individuals, from people with... Um, you know, an axe to grind and this sort of thing. And in this case, this is what seems to have happened. But I think they are um, dicing with danger, if frankly. If I'd seen that on your social medias, I too would have had a bit of a pop at you, to be honest, Richard. You can't pin that on Harry and Meghan. As you made the case, often curious individuals, I'm going to call them rather than deranged. I mean, one even snuck into the Queen's bedroom. But when Harry was still probably in short trousers, I can't remember, but a couple of decades Thankfully back. not armed with a crossbow. No, but right in her bedroom rather than just scaling a perimeter wall. So I think mm. we need to keep this in perspective. And I think you need to hold back on blaming some kind of, you know, agenda coming from across the Atlantic. Well, well no, I think they need well, to hold back on this sort of well, inflammatory let, let's just speech. Let's move on to the other interesting story about Meghan and Harry this week in the Archwell Foundation. Now, this week, we've, you know, despite all the fanfare and the fancy websites and all the amazing deals... Are we right to feel a bit surprised that it's raised less than $50,000 in its first year? It was a surprising story, um, but it, it seems to be a reflection of the fact they've taken their time to establish it and with the pandemic and everything. I mean, with all charities, I remember writing about how Prince Harry's um, charity for orphans in Africa, Centre Bale, that also spent a lot of money initially. And I think when you're setting up a, a charity, it does cost a lot mm. to start with. Um, but Are you actually sticking up? Yeah, there? I was about to say, this is staggering. <laughs> no, <laughs> Tell us bit. more. Uh, no, yeah. just to, to put yeah. the context, but what will be fascinating to see is how much they raise in the future. Um, I mean, in, in the case of the Royal Foundation with William and Catherine, once Harry and Meghan left, they started getting far more money. So we'll see. It'll be interesting to see how much Harry and Meghan raise. Mm. I think it's very easy to be cynical, but let's hold on to the fact this was a set-up year. You know, costs way outstrip any profit of any sort in a setup year. And I'm also going to ask you to hold your horses and not have very high expectations for next year's uh, financial report, because, of course, this has been their maternity paternity year with Lilibet. We have, of course, I think Harry's biography to look forward to this year. So I mean, there are other irons in the fire. Yeah.